BSc Forestry student and uh, he has done the MSc and PhD in Agriculture Statistics. So the finance part is how you can collect your data, how to, uh, how to produce your data. So that is very much important in today's live uh, business style. And uh, he is uh, going to tell us the statistical modeling in contemporary size. And uh, we have requested Dr. Ibar, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, this is Iqbal. I think uh, Sar has given a very good introduction. And I'm not so worthy enough for that. But having said that, my topic is on statistical modeling in contemporary sciences in modern sciences since your training is based on entrepreneurship so decision making is very important and for that statistic statistical modeling plays a very vital role okay i guess you all are from uh, all research scholars here and you must have a certain basic knowledge about the statistics so i'll be focusing morely, mainly on modeling now nowadays the term statistics which we uh, nowadays use, it has been changed by the name of data science. Just like uh, physics use mathematics yes, in finding their conclusions, similarly data science uses the collaboration of mathematics, computer science and statistics. So nowadays a more fancy term rather than. Now as far as the statistical statistics is concerned, as you all know, that we start with the collection of the data, in fact the collection of the information from our experimental findings. Okay, then we use to apply a standard statistical tool, then we analyze it, then we finally get the results in terms of tables, in terms of graphs, and finally we give our interpretations. But what actually statistics, in my opinion, is it is strengthening technological advancement through implementing systematic te techniques into contemporary science. This is actually the statistics is. Because every science requires statistics in order to prove your experimental findings, but the statistics is the only subject where we does not require any kind of help of any other subject we can generate the data by means of simulation techniques now as far as the data science is concerned decision making and prediction these two are very important and fundamental basis for setting up any kind of policy planning at regional or national level or uh, by uh, making your own enterprise because decision making is very important that comes into the context of policy and planning now I have shown two pictures, one is a skateboard and another one is a helicopter. Now if we use a skateboard we can move from one locality to another locality by playing and enjoying also. But when the distances are too far, say for example from one uh, town to another town you may have different kind of terrains, different kind of topography, you may not be able to reach that destination. Then if you have an alternative for that, you have a helicopter, you have enough resources, you have a helicopter, you can move from one place to another place in a very short span of time and much quickerly. Now this is the difference between the traditional statistics and the statistical modeling. Decision making, we can use a simple basic test of significance, we can use a t-test, we can use Zard, we can use f, we can use chi-square test. But as far as the prediction is concerned, we can take decisions also uh, at, at the same time we can frame the policy based on the collection, based on the information you have uh, you have got from your study. So this is very important. The traditional statistics and the statistical modeling. In my opinion, the differences between the skateboard and the uh, helicopter, and similar is the difference between the traditional statistics, the traditional test of significance, and the statistical modeling. Because prediction is very important. Now, moving ahead, since my talk will be mainly focused on modeling, now what is a model? As we all know, what is a model? Model, if we uh, see the dictionary meaning of the model, it means to represent. And the process of representation is known as modeling. But actually, what is modeling? Modeling is nothing, it's a formalized way of approximation with some purpose. Now, when you approximate something, what you are going to do? You are going to make predictions based on that approximation. That, that is modeling. Now, the one thing is very important, it is actually the representation. We are approximating something and we are actually representing that. Now there are different ways of representation. I will take my own example. When I was a kid, I used to play, even every kid is fascinated with playing with the toys. Okay, I was playing with a toy aeroplane as if I am actually play, uh, flying or I am actually uh, playing with the actual Boeing 747. That is the representation. 
Then I became a bit of adult. I thought a model is a representation of a person who is wearing some kind of fancy clothes. But now, actually, when you are actually engaged with the sciences, with the researches, or with the entrepreneurship, you are actually assessing that it has something to do with mathematics or statistics. So actually, model is nothing. It is expressing a certain kind of phenomena in terms of mathematical equation. That is why I have written the y is equal to function of x. OK? I think this is clear. You can ask me the questions at every slide, OK? I will not get irritated because I have been grilled so much by my teachers. <laughs> no, as I have said, the model is actually the approximation with some pr purpose, decision making, and uh, prediction. OK? Now, why we go for modeling? Because we want to identify the pattern, the actual pattern which is present in your data based on the variables of the study. OK? Classification, classification of different kind of events then entangling different kind of influences that shape the outcome because when you are fitting a certain kind of a model for decision making or policy planning actually you are more focused on the what is the actual outcome of that then assessment then assessment in terms of the strength of the evidence or the strength of the power of the strength of the equation which you have fitted on the data which you have taken from your experiment from your survey, from whatever the enterprise or whatever the thing you have made. Now, actually, it is nothing. It actually mimics the reality. OK? It gives an insight to the real world phenomena that converts that into the mathematical equation. And based on that equation, we can conclude, we can make a certain kind of decision. Now, as for I will not go deeply into the statistics now, since I'm uh, I'm a statistician, so I have to show the worth of my subject also. Now, if we see there's an equation y is equal to x beta plus e, it is actually the representation of m uh, model in a matrix form, where y is a vector of response. As you all know, it is our study variable, main variable of interest, and commonly known as a dependent variable. OK, then x is actually a design matrix. You might have a one variable. Now you are having different kind of variables. We are affecting a certain on a certain variable. You are using your own enterprise. You have set up a, your own enterprise. And you want to see what are the different factors which are affecting my profit, which are affecting my cost. OK, now the beta, which is a parameter and which is actually estimated based on the data collection you have or based on the data you have and this a this is all the all the game of statistics is played by this e this is known as error, error term now in common traditional statistics which we in our university or in our faculty because most of the students are from from our fa faculty we used uh, experiments in a controlled conditions we, you, we used to conduct our experiments in labs we used to conduct our experiment in open in fields or we used to go for surveys now we have different categories for that and what are these three different categories there are fixed effect random and mixed effect okay now fixed effect is traditional analysis of variance which you used to apply either the common CRD completely randomized design or we have actually that is a model OK, don't get confused that it is a certain kind of experiment. Actually, the whole base of that experiment, either in lab or in field, it is actually a model. Although we have different kind of designs based on the circumstances and based on the kind of an objective of your study you have, you used to apply. That means all the parameters in that model, they are fixed. Actually, the parameter of interest is fixed as it is shown in this uh, equation here. The parameter of interest is fixed because we are mostly interested on the estimation of that parameter not from the source from which it has originated now if we are interested more in generalizing more on the source from which it has originated then we apply random when we have the collaboration of both then we have mixed it and in case of multi environmental trials or multi location trials we use to apply mixed effect model now now what are the different stages now this is actually my talk what are the different stage in context of model modeling in context of decision making? OK, what are the whenever you conduct a certain kind of a study, you have to define a certain kind of a problem. Then for that, you have to set a certain kind of hypothesis. Mm -hmm. OK, the statement of the problem is very important because that statement at the end of your result, at the end of your study, you may agree with that, you may disagree with that. OK, 
and which is commonly known as statistics has a hypothesis mm -hmm. okay although we have different kind of hypothesis I will not go into the detail for the sake of information of all the participants we have null we have alternative hypothesis and null is very important because that hypothesis is actually set for its possible rejection because when you reject something that means you have got the proper evidence for that okay until and unless you don't have any evidence you will accept that statement as such then collection of data is very important filtering of data is very important cleaning of data is very important cleaning in the sense if there are certain kind of observations that are extreme one which are commonly known as outliers or in statistics we call them leverage okay if we have that kind of data set how what are the different procedures what are the different tools we apply for filtering that data for cleaning that data because every time we cannot remove a particular observation because if we remove something that means it may might have a drastic effect on the final results of our data so we have to be very uh, we have to take extra care about whether we have to deal it whether we have to apply certain kind of transformations or we have to include it so that is very important that comes under the category of data cleaning then fitting the model appropriate model you used to apply different kind of models you used to evaluate them based on certain selection criteria. with the help of that we used to select a particular model with some prerequisites but the traditional thing is we apply models, we deploy models, we simply take the value of our square, okay? Then we say it has got the highest value of this thing. That is why we are deploying it. But that is the wrong procedure. We have to validate our this model. We have to test the reliability of our model. And for that, we have to apply a proper validation technique. Okay, we have different validation techniques. That means you have got a data, you have to split it, okay into different things which i will discuss them in later slides so proper validation technique is very important proper execution of data cleaning process is very important and the prime important thing here it is that is your hypothesis and that depends upon the objectives of your study okay then deployment ultimately when you apply a proper technique validation technique then on the basis of that you have got a lowest amount of error in your model in prediction error actually then you deploy it now generally speaking the problem of statement is very important and very important thing in decision making and policy and planning the target variable what kind of target variable what kind of dependent variable you are having or you're dealing with or what kind of variable of interest you are dealing with you might have a two category of variables and you have to use either a classification problem or a regression problem which in contemporary sciences which we use to nowadays we are classifying things only on two things either on classification or on regression problem so only difference is we have a variable which is continuous in nature or we have a variable which is categorical or nominal or we have a discrete variable then whether your data is linearly separable or not whether you are able to apply an algorithm now which is actually a model which uses a different sequences and different procedures to uh, reach a certain point so that you can make a decision whether your data is linearly separable or not whether you are able to totally classify whole of your data set or not okay then size of the data this is very important nowadays everyone is talking about the big data big data and big data although you don't have to worry about that big data is a concern for the people who are engaged with the social media platforms or the business industries not for the persons who are engaged with the research or certain kind of entrepreneurship now for a statistician and for a researcher it is very important the size of the data set now we have traditional models now we have some kind of a fancy thing that is known as artificial intelligence nowadays now what is actually the thing that makes us to actually apply this artificial intelligence what are the different prerequisites and why we are unable to fix the problems which you used to face in case of conventional or traditional modeling because of the reason we have high variability 
we are encountered with overfitting. We apply particular traditional models, there's a problem of overfitting. That means the results are overestimated. Now, restricted assumptions, as we all know, are statistical procedures. They are based on certain kind of assumptions. Until and unless those assumptions are not fulfilled, we cannot proceed. Either we have to apply certain kind of transformations, or we have to go to the parallel statistics, or the alternative form of statistics, which is known as non-parametric. But doing that, we may reduce the power of our tests. Then, non-normal distribution. This is usually a pre-request for every statistical procedure. Okay? Now, in data is an important issue that needs to be handled. Now, do we have certain kind of procedures where we don't have to worry about the high variability of the data, the size of the data, the kind of a distribution of the data, overfitting, we don't need any kind of assumptions. Do we have? Yes, in modern contemporary science we have, thanks to the concept of artificial intelligence. As you all know, artificial intelligence, actually, it was given by John McCarthy in 1956. This concept was given by John McCarthy, and it has got two subsets nowadays in context of data science. One is machine learning, and another one is deep learning. Machine learning, where a machine actually learns by experiences. Okay? It was later founded in 1959, this term was given. This machine learning term was actually given in 1959 by Arthur Samuels. You can Google it out. Then, as far as the deep learning is concerned, it was given way back in 2000 by Iger Eisenberg. Artificial intelligence is an umbrella under which deep learning is machine learning and deep learning. Artificial intelligence actually, it mimics the human behavior. Now, what actually this machine learning does? It actually, the machine, the algorithm, the equation learns by experience. If you will take the example of YouTube, okay? You write down the keyword. Coco Melon songs, nowadays all the babies are used, seeing this. Next time when you will again go to the YouTube, automatically those videos will reflect. Because that algorithm, it actually learns by itself. So same thing happens in nowadays. These algorithms are now used, now we use to deal with the complex set of data sets. Now, deep learning, this is a very important concept. Some of the students or some of the participants have heard about the neural network modeling. Okay, where actually it mimics the behavior, not the human behavior, the analogy, the anatomy, the structure, the functional functionality of the brain. It mimics the brain, how it executes and how it operates. Okay, so these are the different things and nowadays in modern science, I guess in com contemporary science and whosoever engaged with the research or dealing with the data, these two things always comes in our mind. Now. As I have said, the problems with the traditional modeling is restrictive assumptions and non-linearity because biological phenomena will never find a linear relationship. You may have to deal with certain kind of non-linearities and overfitting, okay? Overfitting is a very uh, problem which, uh, because once your uh, estimates are overfitted, so you will make a decision on that, you will frame a policy on that. Actually, after five or 10 years, actually when they, you will apply them, your results will be contracted. And this will have a very drastic effect on the end user, whosoever is or he or she is using it. Now, these are some of the important assumptions or as you see in the graphs, we can say we have a very important restricted, uh, a very important assumption in statistics, our data, even uh, not data, actually it is a game of errors. Our errors should be normally distributed with zero mean and uh, constant variance, which is actually known as a one. Now, these are some of the problems which are faced in the traditional modeling and they are actually taken care by this artificial intelligence. Now, since I was talking about how we can uh, overcome these things. And this neural network modeling is actually, it comes under the umbrella of deep learning. Like I have said, artificial intelligence, what is actually does? It mimics the human behavior. Machine learning learns, the machine learns by experience. But the deep learning actually mimics the human brain. And first important algorithm which is used nowadays, although not nowadays, it has been used for, for past one and a half decade, now, we are now very much concerned about these things, that is neural network. Now, what is a neural network? 
whenever you are dealing with a certain kind of complex relationships, that means complex in the sense there is non-linearity present in your data mm -hmm. with respect to the variables which are under consideration. The data is very complex. You have a different kind of a data. Then in order to handle that, you can use this kind of an algorithm. Actually, it is a model. And more fancy term is algorithm. OK? Now, neural network modeling, actually, you can see, like the human brain, it consists of dendrites, neurons. OK? It takes signals from the associated neurons by means of certain kind of interaction, which are known as synapses. Then it, that uh, information, it is summed up in the cell body, because you all know what is actually the concept of this. Then when it reached a certain kind of a threshold, then it passes that information to the next neuron by means of, again, the synapses. The same concept is used by neural network. OK? It actually uses the same concept. So that concept is mimicked in this algorithm. Now, what is actually the basic structure of this neural network model? It has got three important layers. One is input layer, another one is hidden layer, and the third one is actually output. And that depends upon the target variable, whether we are having a continuous or we are having a discrete variable. That means whether our problem is regression problem or whether our problem is classification problem. OK, now what this actually input layer does, what hidden layer does, and what actually is the role of the output. OK, actually, this input layer it takes the information from your variables, OK? Uh, those variables on which you want to see the effect on a particular variable. It takes the information from that, then passes that information to the hidden layer by applying certain kind of weights. Now, what are those weights that depends upon the influence, the contribution of that variable to the next level? And what actually from one step to another step, that means from one in, from input, input layer to uh, hidden layer, how it works, since it is an iterative process. OK? Now, what amount of weight, what amount of weight from one layer to another variable, that depends upon actually the heart of this network. That is known as activation function. Activation function of this neural network is the heart of this neural network. Actually, it is an essence of this whole network. OK, you have input layers, you have hidden layers. OK, the information is processed in the form of neurons, which are actually the simple computational units. Takes the information from the input variable, from the variables, OK, passes that information to the hidden layer, OK? When it passes to the hidden layer, then it goes under certain kind of iterations. Now, what kind of iterations we have? For that, we have two different procedures. Either they can use, or this algorithm, it can use a back propagation method. Mm -hmm. When I say back, that means it is going backwards. OK? Then a feed forward. It is only a one-way process. But a back, back propagation is a two-way process. It takes a certain kind of a circle. It takes a certain kind of iteration, reaches to a level where the level is minimum, where the error is minimum. When the error at a certain state is minimum, that it passes the information to the next neuron. OK? So from one neuron to another neuron, this algorithm uses an activation process, activation function, and that takes certain kind of weights. And those weights depend upon what is the important importance of that variable, whether that variable is important as per the iteration of my algorithm or not. If it is not so important, it will give, give less weight to that variable, or uh, uh, not variable to that input. If it is more important for that, then based on this propagation method, either feed forward or backward, it will uh, apply a smaller or a larger amount of weight. OK? So activation function, this is the whole structure of activation function. Now, what kind of activation function we can apply? It depends. It depends upon, again, like I have said in my previous uh, slide, on your target variable. We have different kind of activation functions. And when you change the activation function, the prediction power of this algorithm will get changed. OK? 
the prediction power of this algorithm will get changed. I have shown some activation functions here, linear, sigmoid, tangent, different kind of algorithms, but we have to take care what kind of uh, this activation function we are using. Now, as I have discussed, this is the basic structure of this. We might have one layer, single layer, or we have multiple layer of uh, neural network models. One layer means we have a single set of uh, neurons in our hidden layer. If we have more than two sets, that means it is a multiple layer. Now, how we can choose the activation function? How we can choose the activation function? If our target variable is a categorical one, if our target variable is a continuous one, we have a choice then what kind of activation function we have. Like in this we have, and nowadays in modern data science, what we have, we have two kinds of problems. One is classification and another one is regression. Now as far as the classification is, we mostly use to apply sigmoid function, okay, uh, sigmoid function, then softmax function, then again we can use sigmoid function for multi-class because we might have a categorical variable which might have two classes, three classes or four classes, that is why. But for uh, regression problem, not the traditional regression we use to apply. It is actually when I say a classification problem and regression problem, that means my target variable is continuous. It's not something that I am applying a traditional uh, uh, this regression equation. It is actually my target variables con uh, continuous. For that, we use to apply linear function. So we have to be very cautious about this. What kind of activation we have to apply, activation function we have to apply. And for that, target variable is very important. Then when you apply this neural network modeling, you will get a this kind of a plot. Okay. As you see, these blue lines, these blue lines, these are actually the biases. And these circles, these are neurons. And from this circle, this arrow, this is actually the input. This is actually the weight. What amount of weight from one neuron to another neuron can be associated in this? Then these uh, weights, they can be uh, thought of the similar, <laughs> like you know in the regression equation, we have these regression coefficients, okay? Same thing here, okay? Now these blue lines, these are actually known as biases in context of the neural network, but they can be think of the similar intercepts we have in our regression equation then finally our this uh, target variable here it is a hypothetical example here and similarly since you can see it has taken 201 steps because it is an iterative process then finally at what error at what stage it gets stopped because it takes so many iterations suppose here in case it has taken 201 steps iteration and at 201th iteration the minimum lowest error has been displayed it is 0 0.06 okay now moving ahead what are actually the different steps for applying this neural network modeling the first thing is data standardization then what kind of parameters how many number of layers then proper validation technique and finally the accuracy okay now data standardization why it is important because you are dealing with a large number of variables and when you have large set of variables every variable might may not have same kind of units it may have get different kind of units so in order to put them in a common scale we used to standardize the data we used to standardize the data now for that we have two procedures one is minimum maximum procedure and another one is z score okay so these are the two different procedures by which we can we can change the scale of this data we can standardize the data okay by making standardized data or standardization of the variables these variables they become unit free unit free because you might have a variable which will be in kgs you might have a variable consumption that will be in rupees or it has got a unit of price you might have a variable which will be in centimeters you might have a variable which means kgs per hectare so different variables have different units so in order to adjust them to a common scale you apply this procedure you have choice you can use both of them okay there's no there is no preference here they are equally likely you can take any one of them now you can you don't you don't have to uh, use them manually now all these things are taken care by softwares nowadays now parameters like i have said how many layers how many layers if you are taking a single hidden layer how many neurons you have to use 
okay how many number of layers you can use usually two third of the input variables is uh, used in case you have large number of variables and for a single input and output you have a different uh, criteria which i will show you in the later slides then validation now why validation is important and what is validation that means you are fitting a certain kind of algorithm you have to test its reliability how you are going to test the reliability of its uh, this uh, algorithm or a model in general you have to validate it either you can take a different kind of a data set which is not quite possible in every circumstance because of the resource constraints because of the time constraint because of obviously the cost constraints we have for that what if we have to use we have to validate we have to test the reliability of our algorithm or, or our model on the data set which we have used now what is actually a validation process the validation process is it is actually generally known as cross validation it is generally known as cross validation you have a data set you randomly split it into two uh, uh, two different uh, portions two categories on one data set you actually fit your model and on the remaining data set you actually estimate its validity okay you have a data set you randomly you divide it into two categories but that division is done randomly okay so it is not subjective process it is a random process okay then one data set on which you fit your data okay that is known as training set that means you are training your model then on the data set which is remaining this is known as testing data on which you test the reliability of your data okay now there are different procedures of validation validation techniques rather cross validation now what are those one is validation set approach which is a common procedure another one is leave one out cross validation commonly known as lucy v then k folded cross validation which is actually the important cross validation technique now what is a validation set approach you randomly partition the data into two equal house 50 percent in the training set 50 percent but that process is run uh, random it's not by your own choice you will make 50 first 50 observations in this and the next 50 in this no so it is a random process now uh, this is known as half splitting okay now commonly which uh, common uh, validation set approach is 70 30 or 80 20 80 portion of the data set is put in the training set and remaining 20 is put on the testing set or we can use 70 percent in this or 30 percent in this but the problem is when we are taking a large portion of data in training set there might be some observations that are actually meant for the prediction those data points have gone to which category training set because our final execution of model is based on the testing set so that is why this is not usually preferred this is preferred in certain conditions but not usually okay whenever you are actually evaluating the uh, power of a model the prediction power of a model then you have to take extra care which validation technique this is the procedure of this now what is actually the demerit of this i have told you i have to, uh, briefly explained that now lucy v lucy v means leave one out as the name itself depicts leave one out you have say for example 100 observations in your data on which you want to fit your model what you will do you will uh put the first data point in the training and rest 99 observations in the testing data set then in the next step you will retain the first one but the second one you will put in the training and rest 99 you will put and similarly up to the hundredth observation so again it is a kind of an iterative process okay so this gives much better result in comparison to traditional validation data set where we used to partition data wholly in 50 percent or 70 30 or 80 20. but the problem with this technique this validation is if there is a data point which is an outlier then it will have a drastic effect on the prediction power of our model okay so again it is not 
very much preferred provided if your data is not having outlier then it can do wonders now what we we need to do then we have a problem we take a large portion of data in training we have a problem we are taking a single data point or single datum in the sense and we have a problem of outliers then what we have to do we have to take a large portion of data set not so large like we have in uh, traditional validation set approach good ratio of testing data and finally the iteration that means if we need a method which is a collaboration of all these three so do we have a method yes that is known as k folded so what this k folded cross validation does it divides the whole data set into k folds now you can google it out 5 and 10 they are most usually preferred when i say 5 this means your whole data set is divided into five folds at first step the first fold is for example five folded first fold will be used for training rest four will be used for testing next step the second will be used a second fold will be used for training and the rest four will be used for testing, testing. and similarly up to the fifth fold here is the beauty that the uh, fold which was used as training in the first it is used as testing in the second so every portion every fold of the data set is used as training as well as testing data uh, data set that is why it is more reliable it is more preferred whenever you are testing the validation or reliability of your valid uh, this model you have to apply k folded cross validation now how we can measure the accuracy now there are two generally important accuracy measures one is for meant for classification another one is made for regression problem as we all know the we in classification pro uh, problem we have an error matrix which is known as confusion matrix and based on then we use to calculate the accuracy which is nothing it's a sum of diagonals divided by the number of rest of the cells okay like in case of uh, regression problem we have aic archives information criteria we have root mean square error we have mean absolute error and prediction error see i have not discussed anything about r square here okay now i will show you why i have not used that by means of certain kind of an example now as far as the data is concerned nowadays its volume is increased it has increased in variety it has increased in velocity also that means it has become complex nowadays okay there was a time when we used to uh, solve some uh, math maths problem or some data problem by means of hands by taking a single pen or a pencil by means of calculators then we moved on to the excel now we have more complex data how we are going to tackle with that yes we can tackle it with that by means of softwares by means of softwares now in my opinion one of the best softwares which is available till date in context of statistical analysis and data visualization that is known as r i know there will be a sort of lot of disagreement with my statement but as far as the statistical analysis i again repeating my words as far as the statistical analysis and data visualization is concerned this is the best available software now if you want to become a programmer or a developer you can use python okay but as far as the statistical uh, analysis again i am repeating it koi kal aisa na bole ki ikbal ne aisa bol diya to again i am repeating as far as the statistical analysis and data visualization is concerned this is the best software available now why it is best as i have displayed it is the most preferred software it is the most unfriendly but obviously the most preferred software unfriendly in the sense it is a lit little bit difficult for the newbies mm -hmm. for the new ones who are first time handling with it but once a person he or she goes into this field although nobody here wants to become a statistician or a programmer but for the sake of information of all the participants this is a very wonderful software now why it is wonderful because it is freely available you don't need to pay anything if you want to get a license spss you have to 
uh, get an amount of around about 80,000, 1 lakh, 2 lakh, 3 lakh rupees. Now, if there's an another important software that is known as SAS, which is given by ICR to each and every state agriculture university. Actual cost of that software, which is developed by University of North Carolina, it is 80 lakh rupees. Now, who is the person here, participant, who is going to afford that? No one. Now, when something is free and it can do wonders, why not to have that? Okay. That is why this is the best software available. Now, why it is known as R? Because the persons who developed it, their initial letter was R. Ross Yaka and Robert Gentleman. In 1995, they implemented actually the concept of S plus language and made it open source so that it will be easily available and to all the users. That is why, due to its extreme flexibility, because you have software, they are muno driven. There are different things given. You cannot move outside those limits. This is free. This is flexible. This is open resource. So you can do anything. And the best part of this is there is no comparison with this software in terms of data visualization. Now, how we are going to implement it? Although I am not having my laptop with me today because I was told in the last week that I have to deliver my lecture, although there was some certain kind of adjustment due to the other resource persons. Now, I will directly go to some examples so that why I have told you that what is the role of statistical modeling in uh, contemporary science so that my job will be done. So as far as some of the important features of this is concerned, it is actually a most preferred in the sense it has got more than 8000 packages available till date, although if you will Google out, it has more than that. Okay, massive community support and I have said there is no comparison as far as the data visualization is concerned. So moving ahead, you can download it freely from Google. You don't need to pay anything. Then I will go to directly to the a case study. Since for that, for this thing, I need to have some hands on. So I will directly go to the case study. HD modeling in chair pine. It's a simple example of HD modeling. HD modeling means high diameter modeling. Okay. Now, as my topic was on statistical modeling, and I have focused mostly on what neural network model. Now, what are the different things which actually makes neural network model more prefer in comparison to traditional and conventional models? Now, I have given some nine models here, which are commonly used in order to uh, estimate the relationship between height and diameter. These are some of the different. Uh, models which I have used here. You see, as we have nine models here, and the common traditional procedure is we used to take these selection criteria. We might take ro uh, root mean square, a model which is having the lowest root mean square, that is preferred good. And obviously the R square, you can see, it is reflected that MG model is having a very good R square. It has got a significant coefficients. That means it is able to capture the underlying relationship between these two variables. And we have got a non-significant shapiro wilk test. That means the errors are normally distributed. OK. Now, this is the traditional procedure. Now, if we will use that MG model to another data set, whether this model will give me the same results or not. For that, what we have to do, we have to validate it. We have to validate it. Now, we have validated it by means of the cross-validation. We have a training category on one side. We have a testing category on one side. And you can see, again, M8 is having a lower values of these criteria. But I have used another model here. That is ANN, artificial neural network. And you can clearly see we are having good results in comparison to that, rest of the models. OK? Now, these are some of the actual fits of these models. Or these eight models, you can see this red line, this is the fitted line. And you have to see it very cautiously. Only that model is preferred, which is able to actually capture the underlying structure of the data. That means it must be between these data points. And those models whose red lines are above this whole bunch of data set or below the bunch of the data set, they are either overestimating, they are either overfitting or underfitting. So this is the problem with the traditional 
high diameter model or the traditional conventional statistical modeling. Because when you apply a traditional statistical model based on these criteria, you will select a model, you will give you a decision for setting up for your own enterprise. You have to take a decision for that. When you will take a decision on this modeling, that model is actually overestimating. So it will have a very drastic effect on your final decision making. For that, what we have to do, we will again compare them with the artificial intelligence based neural network model because of the reason, because of the reason, not for these criteria which are used in uh, common traditional modeling, because of this reason. Because of this reason. You can see ANN. On one side, this is PER, prediction error rate. Okay, it is not a normal R square which we use to apply and that is a wrong procedure. Prediction error rate. A model after validation is considered to be a best fit or a good or a preferred model whose prediction error rate is lower in comparison to the other models. So you can see ARN has got the lowest prediction error both in case of training as testing data set. Because you have split the data in two forms. One is training and another one is testing. On training, you have fitted the model, but the final execution is based on the testing data set. Again, now it is proven that ANN is giving the best results. Now, how many number of neurons, like I have said in my earlier slides? Since we have two variables, one is input, another is output. If we have so many number of inputs, then we have to use two by third of that input variable. Since we have only two variables here, one is input, another one is output. That means one is diameter, another one is height. Now, the hidden layer, how many number of neurons we can use? How many number of neurons we can use? Because as you increase the number of neurons, either the prediction error rate will get decreased or it will get increased okay now these are the different number of neurons i have used in the hidden layer in the first layer you can see there is only one neuron hidden layer in second there are two likewise in third there are three and up to nine i have used and for that we have a proper methodology available which is written here i is equal to under root of j plus m plus r what is i i is the number of neurons in the hidden layer okay now how many number of neurons in the output layer since here it is only one so you can put these values you can see we can range it from 1 to 10 not from 0 to 1 it is actually 1 to 10 so whatever the combinations we have a combination is recommended where our prediction error rate is lower and here the threshold is 0 0.1 that means the iteration is stopped whenever the change in error is less than 0 0.1 percent okay and the final thing because i have although you are very patient audience i have bored you enough this will be my second last slide <laughs> you can see i have used that so many number of combination of neurons and you can see with 10 number of neurons we have lowest prediction error that means as we increase here in this scenario as we increase the number of neurons the prediction error of our model gets decreased okay so one thing is very important here for decision making and prediction for whatever the study you are doing whether you are having your own enterprise or whether you are conducting your research you have to be very extra very very uh, cautious about the proper appropriate modeling technique because if you will apply the traditional one there may, might be the problem of overestimation and underestimation so in order to tackle that you can use these kind of algorithms so that is why the title of my topic of talk was statistical modeling in contemporary science that means in modern sciences now having said this Thank you very much. With the final quote, statistics is like a clay.